Well, good evening. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. We are doing a broadcast that's taking us on LinkedIn, over here on Instagram, uh, Facebook, um, my website, rickdancer.com, uh, Spotify, and all the rest. So uh, good to have you here. Um, you will never believe what I was doing to get ready for this show, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I get a lot of questions from people. Uh, let me tell you who our sponsors of the show are, and then we'll kind of get right into it. You guys can ask things too if you want to, uh, but I've got a list of questions that people ask me all the time, and we're going to get serious, and we're going to get personal. And um, I'm just kind of sick of some of the stuff that I um, do on a daily basis, and I just want to get real. And I want to talk about things that I want to talk about. And, um, and they're questions that people have asked me. And so I'm going to answer those for you. So our sponsors are Chris Dental Family Dentistry, where everyone's welcome. If you live in Eugene, Springfield, or anywhere in Oregon, uh, he's a great dentist. And he also does dentures now. One of our biggest supporters, uh, because he believes in free speech and believes that we should all be able to talk. And that's what we're going to do. Um, despite the fact that, uh, it's funny, today I was listening to a podcast with Jordan Peterson, and he was talking to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, Kennedy Jr. is really anti-vax, any kind of vaccine. And uh, he was asking RFK if he uh, ever got canceled. And he said, oh, yeah, all the time I kicked off of all kinds of platforms. And uh, Peterson says, well, the one I have not been kicked off of is YouTube. And I see later today where that episode uh, was was pulled uh, YouTube pulled it because it was too controversial talking about someone else's ideas about vaccines. Where we got to a place in this world where we as humans accept this kind of shit, I have no idea. But that's coming up a little later in our questions. Our other sponsor tonight is Albert Taylor, uh, Endless Possibilities. They work with people in our community who have different abilities and need a little help, extra assistance uh, with different things. And if you're looking for work, they're always looking for people. Uh, so that's kind of how it works. If you guys have a question, you can put it on here in the comment section. Um, I know it's harder anymore on Facebook to put comments on. I don't know why uh, they throttle everything back, but you know what? We make the best of it. So um, I get a lot of questions from people. And one of the big ones is, um, which I find really funny and interesting, is people want to know where I'm from. Where was I born? I was born in Hillsboro, Oregon in 1959 on June 29th. 1959. So 10 days from yesterday, I will be 64 years old. Um, and uh, yeah, that's another question people ask me a lot, but that's coming up. That's a little bit later. And again, if you guys have a question, you can, you can pipe in there. Um, the second question I get a lot, and I don't know why, because I find this very interesting question, but people will ask me, what is your most painful relationship? And I think that's an interesting question for someone to want to know, but there's a lot of very heady, thoughty people out there. And I'll tell you, honestly, just to be you know really honest with you, um, the most painful relationship I think I've had in my life was with my father. Um, we just didn't get each other. We didn't understand um, one another. And uh, he kind of missed me and I kind of missed him. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, you know, I, 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 I think that I'm over it, but I think it always impacts things that I do. And, and I don't really know how, and I can't really be super descriptive. I, I, I haven't thought about that, but having, you know, the acceptance of your father, um, is, is a really valued thing. So I've tried to do that differently with my boys and, it, and I'm not blaming my dad at all. Um, I mean, there's things he could have done differently, but I think we just had personalities that just clashed and he didn't see um, what I was going to do. But I think in later life, uh, some of the things I've seen about him, he was a speech teacher to start off with um, at Hillsborough High School. And um, then he was a teacher's union negotiator for the Oregon Education Association. So when it came to bargaining my contracts, when I worked at KETI, I was really good at it. Because I'd listened to it at the dinner table and everything with my dad was a negotiation. I mean, from chores uh, to uh, going to church <laughs> to whatever it was, you were always negotiating with my dad. So I learned to negotiate very well and I'm ex extremely good at it. But I think he also taught me um, 
uh, do you think that the generation did what they only knew how to parent? Yeah, Laura, I really do. I, I mean, my parents, my dad at one time was working a couple of jobs uh, so that he, his goal was to put us all through college. And, and they did, you know, and that was their goal. My goal would have been, been able to spend more time with them and um, to, felt, to have felt a little more um, acceptance maybe, maybe like to, to feel like I was good enough. That would have been, um, you know, that's, that would have been more valuable to me, but we don't live our lives and make other people do what we want them to do. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't really happen. Um, uh, so that was a painful relationship. And I think over the years, the older I've gotten, uh, the more I kind of understand him better and can forgive and, and look a little bit beyond. And then when I had two sons, uh, you realize how hard that is to have boys when, you know, for me, it was just tough, uh, because I didn't have a dad around. He wasn't, he worked all the time. I mean, my dad was always working. So I remember going to Cub Scout meetings and all the dads would be there and my mom would be there. Um, or going to, uh, I was in, you know, a choir or something and my mom would be there and my dad was not there. So you, you grew up needing that kind of, so I've tried to do that for my kids, you know, tried to be there and, and show them that. Um, but that's, that's the question. Um, another question I get all the time, I'm looking at my list here is why are you so outspoken? Um, Okay, so this kind of goes back to dad too, a little bit. My dad was very outspoken and you did, nobody got one over on him. <laughs> I mean, he, he was, you know, I mean, he was, uh, and he was a force to be reckoned with. Um, he's real smart and really knew how to talk. Um, but I grew up with, he would ask me questions. What do you think we should do about this or that? And I tell him, and then he go and do whatever it was he wanted to do anyway. And I never realized this till I was like a couple of years ago when I was with, had a business coach and she said to me, why do you do what you do? And I said, because I believe that all people have a voice and whether I agree with you or not, you should be able to use it. And she says, well, why? And I said, I, I don't know. Isn't that a good reason? And she says, I want to know why. And I started to cry and I realized I said to her, oh my gosh, my dad never listened to me. Like I grew up voiceless. I would say things. I would talk about things. I would give ideas. He'd ask my input. I'd give it. And then he'd do something completely different. Even when he died, he knew he was going to die. Came to me and he said, hey, you produce things. Why don't you produce my memorial service? And I thought, oh, that's, I'm honored. Yeah, I can help you figure out what you want to do. So I did this <laughs> only to find out that he had gone to all my sisters and his friends and all these other people and done the same thing with them. So I wasn't special. I was once again, throttled. My voice was throttled. So I'm outspoken because I honestly believe that your voice matters. And I don't want anybody to ever feel how I always felt as I was growing up, that striving to be heard and striving to, for that voice. So if, for those of you who think I get really obnoxious, because sometimes I do, um, there's a reason for that. There's a little Ricky Dancer in there who is going, you don't get to tell me. That's why with COVID, I was so, it was like, no, everything about this is just totally, and I was not afraid. And because it came right into my core of who I am. So then I got all these people on there you telling me that I'm, you know, you're a bad person, you're this. And it's like, none of this matters to me. Do you understand? You're telling me I'm a bad person. You are dealing right now with everything that little Ricky Dancer dealt with, and he is not going to listen to you. So you might as well shut your mouth because I'm, this is, you are, you are 100% wrong. And I am not going to listen to you because you are trying to take away my voice. So they didn't understand that. Plus the fact that I had cancer and I knew that I was not going to put anything else in my body because obviously I already had that caused me to get cancer. Now I'm cancer free and I'm not going to go take a risk and do this. So don't tell me what to do. And that was, it was, that's so frustrating to me. Um, 
What is your greatest fear? That's another question. I'm not a real fear-based person. I'm not very afraid of much. Um, I think, you know, my God, I mean, that's a, that's a super, super hard question. Um, yeah, I'm afraid to fail, but I failed so many times now and I'm so good at it, but, um, I don't want to fail. I learn the most when I fail. I guess my biggest fear would be that, um, and, and I know this is irrational and it's, you know, and, and don't, you don't have to come on and say, you know, that doesn't happen. He wouldn't do that or anything like that. But I guess sometimes I'm, I get, I would be fearful that the best thing for me is to really fall flat on my face and God would let me, you know what I mean? I mean, if you're talking about a fear, um, and the next question I had on my list, um, is what do you ask God? Everything. I mean, you know, what do you want me to do next? Um, you know, today I, I'm going to post this tomorrow. Um, but I went for a run because when I run, running is so hard that it just, you know, that's why I exercise the way I do. I think it's because it's so hard. It pushes me to the place where I am so uncomfortable and I feel like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an imposter sometimes. So I'm running and I got up this morning and I was reading some stuff and, and then I'm listening to Jordan Peterson and they're talking about how the serpent is often hides behind fake uh, um, compassion. So if you were nice, Rick, you would take the shot and, and everyone to make sure that everyone's safe. So it's this false uh, comfort. Uh, uh, what am I saying? Compassion. It's not compassion. It's manipulation. And, and I was kind of going over that in my head and I'm running and all of a sudden, and I was going, God, I am so sick of doing this. I'm just tired. Um, I have a, a couple of weeks ago, some of you know this, a, a, a past friend of mine from the church was calling my com, my, was calling some of my clients who pay my salary as sponsorships and telling them to stop sponsoring because I'm spreading disinformation. So this person is literally trying to destroy my income. And who does that? You know, I mean, how, how do you rationalize that? So then as I kind of took this on, I was kind of listening to what, to what, what um, Peterson was saying and talking about, and I'm thinking, wow, you know what? That's why people can't admit that they've been fooled. Because it's not just that you've been fooled, but you have shunned and thrown people aside, kicked them out of the village, told them they were killers, told them they were liars, scorned them, dis, you know, dismembered them spiritually. And then you find out that this information comes out in different reports that you were wrong, that you, you got fooled, that, that the newest report shows that didn't work at all and you scorned me in the grocery store because I didn't have it on? How do you go back? I mean, I understand this, but how do you go back now and your whole foundation was a lie that you built it on and you destroyed people's lives, you fired people from hospitals, you kicked people out of the military, you kicked people out of their jobs, their careers, you made them leave their careers and you were fooled. How do you admit that? So most don't. Because how do you live with yourself for that? I don't know. So that's what I ask God. Do you, so I ask him, do you, you know, am I supposed to just keep doing this or what? What the hell are we doing here? And after listening to Jordan, they were saying, you know, too many people won't speak out. And those of us who can and will must. 
and I'm running and I'm thinking, yeah, this is what I'm called to do. And right as I said that, two bald eagles go flying over my head. I'm not kidding. Right over my head. And I looked up and I went, the symbol of freedom in America. Bingo. I'm off. So I'm not stupid and I'm not naive because, you know, but here's what I also know. And this is a story that Jordan Peterson told on his podcast. God went to Jonah and said, these people in Nineveh are screwing up. I'm going to destroy them all unless you tell them. You have to go tell them they're wrong and they better repent or I'm going to take them all down. And who wants to do that? So Jonah says, fuck you. <laughs> and, and he goes and gets on a boat to escape God and his calling. And you know the story. The, the, the storm comes. And everybody on the boat, the sea, sailors are superstitious. They're going, okay, God's mad at somebody. And they go around and ask everybody. They figure out it's no, or it's uh, Jonah. And so they throw him out of the boat. <laughs> yeah. So then the big sea monster comes up and swallows him for three days. And he spends three days contemplating, just like Jesus spent three days in the tomb. Um, and he contemplates what's going on here. And he goes to Nineveh, he tells them they're wrong, they repent, and they're saved. So the moral of that story to me is, if I'm called to do what I'm doing, then if I don't do it, it's worse than if I do do it. Because I certainly don't want to get thrown out of the boat. I don't care if you throw me out of the culture, but you're not going to throw me out of the boat. And I certainly don't want to be eaten by a sea monster. So somewhere in there is my calling. But I'd be lying if I told you that I understood what that is and how it's going to happen. All right. I've got more questions, but I got two commercials I got to run. You folks over here. You're not going to hear any of this because I got my earphones on. I'll talk to you a little bit over here. Hang on. One of the biggest things for people that I have supported, um, one of their complaints has always been, why do they talk to me like I'm a baby? Why can't they talk to me like they're talking to you? And they're absolutely right. They're very smart. The people we support are very intelligent. And so when you talk to them as if you're talking to a small child, it's offensive. And so, yeah, I think educational videos, you know, bringing that here to show everybody would help. They know that they're not perfect. They know that they're special. That's what some of them say to me, at least, that they know they're special because they don't really like to refer to themselves as having disabilities. They like to say they're special. And so they don't, they, they know this, they're aware of that. They don't want the community to throw that back at them because it's perceived negatively when that happens. So having that education to understand that they're just like you and I. This guy's really good. Shannon is the best interest I've ever seen. He's, he was coming in on Fridays, and now he's coming on Fridays and Monday. But everybody that leaves uh, with him, uh, I, he always has me come. He goes, come here, because I'll come in on Fridays. He's like, and they look absolutely beautiful. They, uh, the patients, there's hardly any redos. Like, I, I wish, and I probably will advertise a lot just to get him some momentum, but he is so good. He, he's the best centrist I've ever met. Yeah, his his outcomes because you know you make denture and they don't fit very well, they don't look very good. He's awesome. Not only does he, you know, take the impressions. He, um, yeah, there's a lot of art to taking impressions, but he's also he also makes the dentures. Um, he, he's a, he's fantastic. I love having him. He's made my life a lot easier because I don't have to worry about dentures anymore.
Okay, if you guys have a question, um, you can write it in the comment section over here on Facebook uh, if you're on the, one of the right pages. And um, I already got one over here from Instagram from Laura. And she said, how did the Thurston High School shooting affect you? Um, in the biggest, that, was a, that was the most impactful story I've ever done in my life because it was my community. And up until then, I had played the journalist game and, you know, I was fair. I always have still was fair. But I, when, when the shooting happened, and these were my neighbors and my school, my area went to Thurston. So it wasn't my kids yet. They were too young, but my neighbors. So this was first and um, it was my town and somebody had messed around with my community and I took it real seriously and I never reported the same way again, ever, because I realized what was more important than my reporting or my image or my face on TV or all that bullshit was that I truly took care of my town. I, years and years and years ago, hardest time I ever had at KGI. It wasn't very, I really, it was a good job for me and it was a good career, but it was really it's, uh, draining. I think that's why I got cancer. I think it was so stressful that that's what got me. That's why I ended up getting cancer. But I remember one time years and years ago when Lisa Birch was there, they had a um, consultant come in looked over everybody and said, I was the problem. Said, you need to get rid of Rick. He's not very good. Um, and they came to me right before I was to go on the news, literally four o'clock and said, all that. We're going to look for somebody new. Uh, you'll keep anchoring the news in the meantime. And um, we just don't think you're very good. Now go do the news. It's like, what the fuck? are you kidding me? I didn't. I went home. I said, I just got to go home tonight. I'm too upset. I can't do this. So they, for a year to the day, they, I was on the chopping block. I knew it felt horrible about myself. Uh, everybody in town knew all the other stations knew all the other anchors knew I was the loser. Um, I was the big shit. Everybody knew the story. Uh, everybody's just waiting. When's it going to come down? They bring in people to try them out and then they'd lie to me and not tell me what they were. Oh, this is Bill so-and-so and he's just going to read some scripts with Lisa. Well, I knew what he was there for. He was there to take my job. And I remember this one guy came in and they brought him up to me and um, that's why he was there was to take my job. And he couldn't even look me in the eye and the station never told me anything, but we all knew. So he came in, walked up to my desk, and I was just like, oh, I just wanted to cry. And I just stood up. I introduced myself. I'm Rick Dancer. Shook his hand, and I said, good luck. I hope you get the job. And um, I turned around, and I sat back in my seat. He walked out with Lisa to go do a little screenshot. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody in the room, all of us were in one big room back then. The engineers had come in. Everybody was kind of watching. And they all started clapping. And later, one of the engineers came up to me and said, that was classy. All of us were sitting there wanting to cry. And you stood up and you welcomed that guy and, and told him you hoped he got his, your job. Well, he didn't get my job. And a year to the day, another marketing company came in. They did the research. They showed them that I was the most popular anchor in Eugene. And they had to pay me right there another $12,000 a year um, to keep me. And then all the managers had to sit with me at a table and apologize for the year of hell that they put me through. And that was the most amazing experience ever because I remembered the Bible verse where God says, I will seat you at the table with your enemies. And here were my enemies at the table with me one by one, having to apologize for the shitty, shitty, shitty thing that they had done to me for an entire year. At that point, 
I had so much. And one of the things that I did right off the bat when they said they're going to get rid of me, a friend of mine said, you need to make yourself so valuable to that station that they can't get rid of you. So I started speaking at every school, every charity event that had needed an MC, I emceed it. I was everywhere, all over the place, just made the community fall in love with me. And then when it came down after the years and years after that, every I could go and ask for what I needed for my family and they had to give it to me because they had already screwed it up and, and I had developed the power inside the community. Not, uh, not that I was so great. They liked me because I went out and served them. Um, that's pretty incredible that you can do that. Uh, Brandon over here, <clears throat> he's asking, um, who is your favorite meteorologist to work with? Uh, John Fisher by far. Um, John Fisher was a great guy, um, a hippie. <laughs> but we'd get in some really interesting conversations and John and I politically agreed on probably very uh, nothing actually. And John was the kind of guy who would say stuff like, um, he would say, you know, if you said, yeah, well, it's sunny out there. Well, there's a cloud over there. He was kind of an Eeyore. I mean, seriously, nobody thought that. You didn't come across that way, but he was kind of negative that way, a little bit of an Eeyore. But I really liked working with him. When I worked the night shift, um, he and I had to get in some great conversations just about kids and life and stuff like that. So he was good. Um, it was, it, it, he, he was very good. Um, so what does your, I get this question all the time from young people. Um, what does your 63 year old self tell your 20 year old self? Cause I think there's a lot of young men out there who are struggling to find value. And I get it. I remember that. And at 63, I would look back at Rick dancer. You know, what I even do, I would even look back at Ricky dancer, that little kid. And I'd say, you know what, Ricky, it's going to be all right. You're going to be fine. You're going to find your way. You're going to, you're going to find out that people aren't scary. I'll tell you a story. I was so shy when I was a kid that, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take this off. I was so shy when I was a little kid that when I finally got a job at a lumber yard, I was in high school. I had a boss who who um, I was waiting the counter. And one day about a month into the job, Harold Eastman came up to me and he said, Rick, these guys want two by fours, nails and bullshit. And you're not giving them any bullshit. Eight years later, when I graduated from college and left that job to take a job at, in Coquille, Oregon at a radio station, Harold looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, I think we created a monster. <laughs> I love that man because he showed me how to be a man. He showed me how to not be afraid of people, how to stand up to them. Um, you know, people would come in and they'd say, I want a two by four standard and better, which is one of the cheapest ones you can get. And I don't want any knots in it. Well, there's no such thing. So I used to look back at him and say, hey, when God stops making, when God starts making trees without limbs, I'll call you. But for now, that's what you pick out. And learn how to butt up against people and say, no, this is... I love you. You're kind. Yeah, I'm going to be nice to you, but here's the boundary right here. And you don't get to pick through every two by four and take all the good ones. So everybody else gets the shit. That's not how this works. And he taught me how to do that simply by being himself and taking that. So when I look at young men today, that's one of the things I want to do with this podcast. And I don't quite know how to do it. That's one of my goals here. I want to make it something for young men who are like me didn't have a good father image. Not that I don't have a good father. I just didn't have a good father image. Nobody told me how to be a man. And I want to help those young men kind of grow and be better and, and, and understand um, and give them the power. You know what I mean? And that's in them to find out who they really are. But I don't know how to do that. I mean, I know how to do it for me and I know how to do it one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know how to translate that into this. That's probably more than I was going to share. Um, what scares you about growing old? Everything. <laughs> you really, you know, I'm an active guy. Um, 
I, I, I love my life. I want to, I, you know, I, you know, I have hearing aids now. Yeah, I'll show you. It was humbling. They call them. That's them. Okay. So I have moderate to severe hearing loss. It's all that Aerosmith I listened to. So that was humbling, but notice I don't have the ones you can see. <laughs> Vanity is there. Um, you know, and, and as anybody on here gets in your 60s, things just don't work like they used to all the time. So you have to find ways around that. And, and I don't want to be a burden. You know, I want my wife and I just, you know what scares me the most? Mm -hmm. Is that she would die before me. I don't think I can do that. I want to die before my wife. Um, Brandon writes over here, did you ever have a story or stories you wanted to put on the air that your superiors wouldn't allow? Um, I can't remember the details, Brandon, but anything on a car dealership, they would not allow because those were our biggest sponsors. So you think the whole sales team, if you were doing a story on a car deal that went bad or something, they would come in and, and, yeah, it's really it's really nasty. It's just like Big Pharma right now. Have you noticed that Big Pharma sponsors all the newscasts, the nightly news at six when all the old people are watching it because nobody else watches the news? So Big Pharma owns those newsrooms. You think they're going to go do a story on vaccines? Huh? Really? Really? You think they're going to go talk about the bad things that are going on? You think they're going to do that? Hell no. But their responsibility is to do that. But they're not journalists anymore. They're dying. They're, they're ridiculous. The power comes from within. You have to believe in yourself. Um, yeah, I, I agree. When you were located in Eugene Springfield area, did you ever see yourself where you are today? <laughs> no. Uh -uh. I was going to live there forever. COVID really, the reaction to COVID. I mean, we knew we wanted to move to Montana. Kathy and I both did. But I'm an Oregonian. I was born and raised there, and I wasn't planning to leave like that soon. And um, and it, you know, to be really super honest, it's been a really rough transition. And all my friends who I know who've come here too, or people I've met in the prospect of that, they, it's the same thing. If you if you if if you're not called to do this, don't do it. People act like I'm. You're so bitter about Oregon. No, I'm I'm sick about Oregon. And the leadership, leadership, and I use that loosely, and and the people who are hiding the serpent behind the fake compassion, it nauseates me, and I'm not going to be quiet about it. And it's not happening here; it's happening there. So I'm not bitter. I'm just pointing out facts. And if you don't see them, it's because you don't want to, and it's probably because you were fooled. So coming here has been like a real adjustment, you know, and, and it's not like people are just knocking down our doors to be friends. <laughs> Plus I have a pretty public wife. So they see everything. And then the guy down the hall has the a newspaper in town and he loves my most like clinching blogs that I write and he prints them in the local paper. So every week there's a Rick Dancer blog in the paper. And it's usually something super personal that I probably wouldn't put out like that in print, but it's out on here, but it's just a different thing like that. You know, it's tough watching a place you grew up in. Yeah, exactly. MD says it's not bitterness at all. It's tough watching a place you grew up and lived in your whole life turn for the worst. That's just a normal human response. And when I get angry about it, it's because I want to fight for Oregon, but I couldn't do it there anymore. I can't live in that. I, I am voiceless. Remember my basic tenet in life? I have to have a voice. I can't not have this or I will die. So I had to get the hell out of there so that I could get my voice back so I can use it for Montana to tell people in Oregon, it's not like this everywhere else. This is not normal. The rest of the world isn't doing this. While you guys are making rules to make it easier for some of the things like abortion and trans stuff, they're making it harder here. So it's it's not like that everywhere. Amen. We've lived here all my life. I've never even disliked what 
very much. So it's not that I just I hate Oregon or I'm angry at it. The people that say that you are probably the ones who screwed it up. That's the truth. So you don't see it because you love it there because it represents everything you believe. But what about the rest of us? What about the people in Eastern Oregon? What about the people in Southeastern Oregon? What about the people in Klamath Falls? What about the people in Rome, Oregon? What about the people in Jordan Valley? Do you give a shit about them or just as long as the Portland metro area is happy, everything's fine? As long as Eugene Springfield gets to feel fuzzy and warm and wear their hippie clothes, everybody else has to agree with them or get the hell out. That's how it feels to live there when you're not in the culture of the day. When the narrative doesn't fit you. And for years, and then people came on that afterwards and they say, all of a sudden you just say all these things. I can't believe that that you, you know, you say that. Well, I felt that way all the time. But it couldn't do, you can't live in Oregon and be me in my job and tell people what they really think because they really don't want to know. They just want to make it this Oregon's accepting of everybody. No, you're not. No, you are not. You are not accepting of everybody. You're accepting of people who agree with you. You're intolerant. I used to do these things and I'd get up on a soapbox. I have a soapbox at, back at home. And I get on the soapbox and say, you are the very definition of intolerance. You'll tolerate me as long as I agree with you. But as soon as I disagree with you, then you do not tolerate me. That is what intolerance is. And now to be a white dude, you know, I feel like I'm a, and, and, and then it's people come on and go, oh, yes, me, it's your white privilege. Oh, of course, good. This is, this, we need to put down all these other labels, all this other stuff, and start talking to each other. And you can't do that when somebody's sitting back going, well, you're only doing that because you're white. That's racist. It's the same thing. So, God, that got me going. <laughs> so, moving here, was because Kathy and I didn't want to live in oppression. And if you're sitting in Oregon and you're listening to this and going, oh, I'm oppression, I'm sure. That's because you're not one of them. That that tells you right there that you are not hearing what I'm saying. You're not empathizing. That's what Oregon needs. Oregon needs a big dose of empathy, not sympathy, but empathy, to understand that if you don't understand what I'm saying right now, it's because you don't care. All you know is you're right, I'm wrong, and you we're going to make Oregon the way we want it, and then you'll just have to live with that because we're so arrogant that we know everything, and we're right, and you guys are wrong. And then you have been, because I have a different opinion, you'll have to call me right wing, which I'm not. Um, you'll have to call me um, uh, a mega um, because while I do believe making America great again is an awesome thing because Joe Biden sure has driven it into the hole, but I, but to be a mega is different than making America great again. That's a label that goes to discredit you so that you have no, um, that because, and, and that's another tolerant label, right? And there's all kinds of things that you do to try to stop people from having a voice. And that's what I call out when I call things out because it's not fair. You know, what's so funny is there was a lady and I can't remember her name from Eugene. And she and I always did did shows with her on bullying. She's an expert on bullying. She knew um, how to stop it. She did all this research. She was very educated in it. And then as soon as the the dark time came um, and I started speaking out about my questions, asking my questions, um, then she came after me full swing and I, I wrote her one of the final conversations we had online was, wow, you really are an expert at bullying. Not only do you know how to stop it, you know how to do it. And that's what, that's what makes me the saddest about what I see in Oregon is the people that I once thought were so open-minded and accepting, um, what, when fear gets in and it's used the right way, or the, the, to me, the wrong way, when fear is used and all of a sudden it's on the line, you see their true heart. And that is the saddest thing to me because I've lost a lot of friends. A lot of my more liberal friends through the, through the years, um, I've either blocked them or they no longer come on my page. 
because they say, I don't feel comfortable. Well, guess what? I didn't feel comfortable for 30 years living in Eugene Springfield, not politically. And I wasn't a diehard Republican. I lean more right than I do left. And I'll tell you what, when I came to Eugene, I was left. And by being there all that time, it made me turn go right because I went and saw the dumb things that the left were doing. And as for progressive, I'm not even close. That's the most regressive. Progressive is really regressive. Um, that is not, that's not going the right direction. Um, we have heart and brain, not just knowledge. Yeah. So um, anyway, I should probably wrap this up, but that was fun. Um, you know, and, and, and um, so where all this goes, I don't know. What happens next? I, I guess that's the adventure of life. If I was 20 years old again, and I had the knowledge I have today, there'd be so many things I would try. Um, the irony that COVID exposed in our inner circles was lost almost. Brandon, that's very good. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> you know, I can honestly say there's no one that disagrees with me that I hate. I, I don't, I mean, I might not like them and I might've blocked them because they were tormenting me, but I don't hate them. But I've been told by people who used to, that, that they hate me because of my opinion, because of that I'm reading research that they're not reading and I'm hearing things and talking about them <clears throat> that they don't know. And all the while, um, you know, I have to be concerned that Facebook, Twitter, not Twitter anymore, Instagram <clears throat> and YouTube will shut me down. Um, and what a lot of these people end up doing is they just, they report you for, and they say things and then there's nothing you can say about it. Plus I've got bots out there, AI bots, mimicking my voice, doing lives and mimicking me. Cause I've heard people telling me this and it wasn't me that they're, they're asked me, you talked about this. No, I didn't, but it's my voice. It's my face and they're mimicking me. That's one of the reasons I kind of want to stop because that scares the hell out of me, but I don't want to be Jonah. I'm not going to get thrown into a lake or an ocean and I do not want a sea monster to swallow me. I have claustrophobia to be in the belly of a whale <clears throat> would be, that would be enough to kill me. <clears throat> right, well, well, thanks for being here tomorrow night. We have a really fun show. Um, have a woman from here in Montana and she raises dogs. She's a dog trainer, but she's trained these dogs. I have video at, at baseball games. They go out and as soon as the batter drops the bat, the dog goes out, fetches the bat and brings it back. And then she trains them for all kinds of other things too, but she's super cool. And you're going to love that story. And then on Thursday, we might be doing this again. Um, we're still waiting in person and you on social media as well. No, I know lucky. Um, yeah, it's, it's a problem. You quit give and then win. That is the goal. We have to shut you down for a while now. They have been trying to shut you down. I rarely get notifications on your lives like I used to. I know, Sherry, they don't. They've they've <clears throat> they've come in and throttled my numbers. Um, and then they tell me, here's how you can get them back up. How about if you just stop throttling me? Um, yeah, we, we were reaching over 500,000 people. And it's about 360,000 now. And a couple months ago, it was 190. Now it's back up higher, but this is my business. And the fact that they can determine what that, that kind of stuff and that people can go in and try to get me shut down to silence me because they're so scared and they're so fearful. They call it misinformation. We used to call it additional information. And it used to be that we lived in a culture that we wanted to do all of our homework to find out what that, what, what, what we were making good decisions. I'll tell you what, if you want to hear a good, a good podcast, go listen to Jordan Peterson, or actually go listen to Joe Rogan interviewing Robert Kennedy Jr. Um, fascinating. It's really worth your three hours. I promise you. He's also on Jordan Peterson's there's another one on Jordan Peterson that's better. It's episode number 367. I can't remember the guy's name, but that's another one you should go uh, watch. 
Um, those are two people you should really be paying attention to because they're giving out information that everybody else is not. And if you're still watching legacy media, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> All right, I want to thank Chris Spinnell, Dr. Michael Bratman. If you are looking for a dentist, go to him. Tell him you saw me on here. It helps us to keep our, you know, our sponsors happy. Um, and or any of our sponsors on here, give them a call. Say you watch us on their show. You know, Albert Taylor, um, Chris Dental, um, New Leaf Hyperbaric and Wellness Center, BSMD, BS Free MD, um, Fairway Independent Mortgage, Douglas Timber Operators, uh, the New Leaf Hyperbarics, um, Albert Taylor, and we have some anonymous donors too because they don't want to be put up with your with the garbage that comes on here. Um, I've had people try to sell me drugs on recovery pages that Facebook says it doesn't go against their community standards. It's upsetting. Yeah. I've been kicked off of pages. I was kicked off Facebook for two, like two months from doing a live for um, posting a picture of Hunter Biden in a bikini bathing suit um, holding balloons flying over Montana. And they said it was, uh, um, God, what is that, pornography or something? It's like, only if you had to be with them. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate you. But yeah, if you feel like I call our sponsors, let them know. Um, it does help. And uh, if those of you who disagree with me disagree with me, that's fine. But just play nice. You know, play nice. Because I'll tell you, here's the bottom line. You know that whale in the ocean, that sea monster? I know who controls it. And you are just as likely, maybe a little more likely to end up in its belly too. So what you do to other people will come back to haunt you.